Thank you all. Aren't you all excited to be here? What a great meeting. Thank you so much for having me. Um, very happy to speak to you, uh, psoriasis therapeutic update. And just like Dr. Friedman said, not necessarily going to get into the detail of every single therapy. And I think, you know, we've had such a wave in many other diseases recently. It's not so, so much coming for psoriasis, although as Dr. Armstrong said, quite a bit coming in our topical therapy world. Uh, my disclosures, and um, this is, these are my objectives. I want to give a little bit of historical presence uh, for psoriasis and psoriatic disease, particularly where therapies are concerned. I'll talk a lot about comorbidity, so Dr. Armstrong, thank you for teeing me up. And also, we'll review the, some of the clinical evidence and clinical trial data for new and emerging therapies for psoriatic disease. We've really come a very long way from the use of ar arsenic and goa powder for treating psoriasis. Uh, we've had about 200 plus years of psoriasis therapy. And you look all the way over to the right as we started to get into about 1952, we had our corticosteroids. Corticosteroids topically for treating psoriasis are now 70 years old. Um, so it's time for some new topical therapies, albeit as Dr. Friedman uh, intimated, using topical corticosteroids certainly is not going to go away. We're going to combine them with therapies, and I'll talk a little bit about combination therapy because that's where I think our future goes, where treating psoriatic disease and, in fact, other inflammatory skin diseases are concerned. And we've really come a very long way in just about 25 years. The development and the understanding of the use of cytokines in psoriatic disease really has only occurred in that very short period of time. And for instance, if we look at when interleukin-23 was discovered, it was really only 22 years ago. And if we think of the fact that we have three, and really there were supposed to be four agents coming into our toolbox for treating patients with psoriatic disease, I find it pretty remarkable that we have these highly effective agents in our toolbox. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on just what these high-level therapies mean because what they've done, and as Dr. Armstrong intimated, is that they really changed our guidelines. They've changed the way we approach uh, our therapies, and the bar has been raised incredibly high. Uh, Treat to Target is published uh, in the JAD uh, a number of years back, uh, Dr. Uh, Armstrong's uh, Delphi Consensus, also the British Association of Dermatologists, the American Academy of Dermatology and National Psoriasis Foundation, as you know, published guidelines in 2019, and recent, recently the French organization just a couple of years ago uh, really raised the bar quite high as to what our treatment target should be. And we're going to continue to raise these very high bars with our, our therapies and including combination therapies. You know, about 50% of the time we can tell our patients uh, that they can get to a POSI 100, some of the newer generation agents, but that means 50% of the time they can't. And so we need to use combination therapies and we need to add in our topical therapies and not just corticosteroids. As uh, Dr. Friedman and uh, Dr. Armstrong intimated, we now have a lot of these non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory therapies that are going to play a very important role in managing our patients with psoriatic skin disease. This is the Treat to Target from the National Psoriasis Foundation, and it's important that we, we look at this very high bar, which after a six-month period, and Dr. Armstrong talk about, you know, when we make that potential change for shifting therapies, because with 11 approved biologics in our toolbox right now, there might be a tendency to shift a little bit too quickly. But that treat to target really after about six months of therapy, we want to see that BSA somewhere around 1% or less. That is an extremely high bar. Just a little reminder here, I'm not going to spend time on immunopathophysiology. I think everyone in this room understands the Th1 and the Th17 pathways uh, for psoriatic disease and those treatment targets, but nevertheless a reminder that psoriasis is a disorder of uncontrolled inflammation and an imbalance of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. This is a very busy slide, but we're very fortunate because we have a tremendous number of agents in our toolbox. Up at the top, you'll see the topical therapies, and what I've left out of there, because it was really just approved just a matter of weeks ago, and that is uh, topical tapinarov, and we'll talk about that. And we have other agents that are coming to market topically for managing our patients with psoriatic disease. So let, let me jump in for a couple minutes and talk uh, about some of the agents that we have in our toolbox, what's old, what's new, 
And um, Dr. Armstrong just really went over this fairly nicely, but some of the limitations of these conventional therapies are really just the side effect profiles. And with the advent of biologic therapies, our need to be able to, to have to use methotrexate, maybe perhaps as an add-on, but our need for using these agents has really diminished, uh, probably because of side effects. And with drugs like interleukin-17 blockers, when we have someone who has really severe psoriatic disease, we can probably cool them down very nicely with interleukin interleukin-17 blockers, and for that matter, even interleukin-23 blockers, and so the need for cyclosporin has really diminished. Now, I still do use a fair amount of acetretin, AC probably more for palmar plantar psoriasis, and occasionally even as an add-on when I have a patient with erythrodermic psoriasis, but then again, you know, lately our use of these drugs has really diminished because we have such effective therapies in the toolbox. So let's get into some of these agents. What do we have now? We have 11 FDA approved biologic therapies for treating patients with psoriatic skin, and some of these for joint disease as well too, and hopefully a 12th coming to market soon. These are some of the comparative rates of the systemic therapies, and the reason I put up this slide is just to show you really how far we've come. You know, if you look down at the right with methotrexate, you have about a 7 per 10 chance of getting to POSI 100. If you look all the way to the right, if you look at Isaac Izumab, you have over a 40 percent chance of getting to uh, POSI 100. We've really come a long way. Um, we've improved our ability to clear our patient's skin by four times with 17 blockers. And for that matter, if you look at this data uh, on the interleukin-23 blockers and you think of methotrexate, about a 7 percent chance of getting to POSI 100, uh, etanercept, about a 10 percent chance of getting to POSI 100, we have really come a very long way. There's some data on bradalumab, uh, where it's in the control period in, in those clinical trials, about 44 percent of subjects in the trial were able to achieve POSI 100. So we've really come a long way. This is just what I'm referencing in interleukin-23 blockers. We can stand in front of our patients and say, you've got a 50 percent chance of getting 100 percent clear within one year of therapy. And so we really have come a very long way. But I think in looking at the toolbox, we have to take in consideration the conversations that we have. As Dr. Friedman said, every patient is different. Every presentation is different. And perhaps, pray tell, in the near future when we have biomarkers and we start using them uh, more frequently, we can actually target uh, our therapies based uh, on what we find from that information. So the right therapeutic choices are necessary, and they are to some degree based on the background comorbidities that our patients have. And so with TNF inhibitors, there are some limitations like demyelinating disorders. Dr. Armstrong mentioned congestive heart failure. That's usually class three or four. American Heart Association class congestive heart failure. And we have some matters, some issues with some of the infusion therapies, uh, like infliximab, where patients will develop some biologic uh, fatigue, well, they'll need some dose creep, and then just some of the uh, unique properties of some other biologic therapies in the TNF space, uh, like um, sertilizumab, which is pegylated, it's a fab fragment, there's no FC portion, and therefore it doesn't cross not very much of it, the uh, blood placenta barrier, making it uh, more appropriate for an individual, a female of childbearing potential. Uh, Weight-based dosing can sometimes be a big challenge our heavier patients in most clinical trial data tend to not respond quite as well as those individuals that are at lower weights. Inflammatory bowel, inflammatory bowel disease is a confounding factor in, in the setting of using interleukin-17 blockers. Fewer consequences in terms of comorbid background concerns with the interleukin-23 blockers, but even in my experience, I have seen a number of individuals with infections in the post-marketing uh, se setting, and particularly UTIs. And as Dr. Armstrong discussed just a couple of moments ago about a premolast, there are limitations uh, with diarrhea. Uh, weight loss, depression, and suicidal ideation, and also the need to uh, adjust the dosing accordingly in the setting of renal insufficiency. Now, this is really just pretty hot off the press. The FDA just approved Rizankizumab for moderately to severe active Crohn's disease, and I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this, but there are a number of trials that led to the approval of the drug where we not only saw improvements in the simple endoscopic scores, improvement overall in intestinal mucosa, and really long-standing improvement of the intestinal lining. What's the importance of this? Well, now in addition to TNF inhibitors where we say we're covering skin and joint and gut, we now can say that some interleukin-23 blockers like this agent, Rizinkizumab, uh, we can cover the skin, the joint, and the gut. Is it, the drug is improved in all three spaces that are very important uh, coverage for our background comorbidities. 
This is Dr. Armstrong's um, meta-analysis, uh, which is a comparative study uh, looking at all the clinical trials that led to the approval of therapies that we have in our toolbox. This is a, a spider plot that maps out really all the clinical trials. And uh, she showed some of this uh, just a couple of minutes ago, but I want to hone in on POSI-90 responses. And you can see here that if we look at short-term responses, long-term responses, and just overall response, uh, here we see isoquizumab, uh, rizinquizumab, bradalumab, fuselcumab, secukinumab, infliximab, sertilizumab, and ustekinumab, really having the mo most robust data and additionally, if we look at the time to achieving various levels of POSI responses like 75, 90, and 100, uh, we'll see that those 17 blockers and even some of the 23 blockers are the fastest uh, to achieving POSI 75. And much of the same here, where we see the relative ranking of treatments for probabilities of treating long-term uh, POSI response, and we really see there the most effective uh, drug that we have in the toolbox is that of rizinkizumab. And so I think having important conversations, the correct conversations with our patients uh, is crucial as we approach therapy. And one of the other reasons why is because we have other agents that are talked some at the podium, but not always, and those really are the biosimilars. And the question is, will biosimilars really be similar? Now, as we know, I just went over biologics, but just as a reminder, biologics are derived from living cells or organisms, and they consist of highly complex molecular entities, which can be difficult to categorize. And that's the big challenge for biosimilars. And due to the variability of the biologic systems and the manufacturing processes for these medicines, there can be significant degrees of variation. And so that is the challenge for the biosimilar. So what are biosimilars? Well, they're legally approved subsequent versions of the Innovator project pro products. Um, because of their structural and manufacturing complexities, these biologic agents have to be considered similar, but they're not considered generic equivalent to the biologics. So they have to be equivalent to the biological originator drug, they have to be similar to the reference molecule, and they can have any distinctive clinically meaningful differences from that reference product. Yet many of them are going to be covering. So where does the rubber meet the road? Well, what are the similarities between the biosimilar and the reference product? Uh, what do they share? Well, they share their amino acid sequence, that's for sure, and their mechanism of action. But that's about it. There can be differences in the host cell line, the manufacturing process, its protein structure, the inactive ingredients, and its proven similarity to the reference product. These drugs are coming. There's approval in a number of states around the United States. The blue is all the approvals uh, for biosimilars, so there's still a few states uh, left to uh, categorize the biologics and what roles they will play in their different states. And I think what's important here is as the drugs come to market and they come in our toolbox, their preclinical and phase one data must be shown in addition to their phase three data. But with that said, extrapolation is going to be allowed by the FDA. Um, so as we know, well know that extrapolation means that once the drug is approved in one category, that an, an agency like the EMA in Europe or here the FDA will allow for approval in other disease states. So let's say Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, our companion disease state in psoriatic arthritis, uh, JIA, and, and several others. Uh, what about extrapolation factors to consider? Well, the mechanism of action, its pharmacokinetics, its expected toxicities, and it really can't be very different. And then the, the comorbidities and concomitant medications that patients, uh, we, we have to take into consideration with our patients also have to be taken into consideration. So with all that said about biosimilars, let's look at some data. And are they different or are they really similar? So this is the Norswich trial. So this was a switch from traditional or branded infliximab uh, to biosimilar infliximab. So in this 52-week randomized double-blind phase four trial with patients with rheumatoid arthritis, spondylarthritis, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, or ulcerative colitis, who were stable on branded infliximab for six months, after they were switched over to biosimilar infliximab, if you look at the, the, the numbers there, you look at the bars, 
the, the blue is continued infliximab and then the switch over in the, in the yellow to biosimilar infliximab, we really don't see a difference in response. And, and, and what they allowed as terms of a pre-specified inferiority margin was about 15%, and there really isn't any inferiority here. So it looks like there's effectiveness with biosimilars. This is the Danbio trial where also we saw no change in disease activity with a switch Again, using infliximab as an example here, we'll, we'll be looking forward to seeing the use of other biosimilars like adalidumab and also uh, etanercept. But again, we see much of the same clinical trial data when it comes to a number of other areas, not just responses, um, but also patient reported outcomes, uh, hack scores, uh, also um, some markers like a C-reactive protein. BASDI score, Dr. Armstrong just talked about axial disease, really under-recognized and not discussed a lot in our space of psoriatic disease where psoriatic arthritis is concerned, but the point is that we really didn't see differences in responses. So what's the, what's the catchphrase here? What's important? Well, we hope that they'll save some money, and there are some big savings that are forecasted for biosimilars, and so time will tell, and the verdict's really just not out yet. But we're seeing use of these agents already, particularly our rheumatology and GI partners. Why is this important? Well, we have another biologic coming in our space of psoriasis and psoriatic disease, uh, psoriatic arthritis, um, but there's a lot of new products that are coming. <coughs> and coming soon to a theater near you, some new oral therapies, some topical therapies, and, and hopefully one new biologic agent. And I want to talk about these as I close. Um, uh, Tepinarov was just approved, and I really know that, um, oh, thanks, Joe, appreciate that. Um, you know, we know that Tepinarov was just approved, uh, an oral agent to Kravacitinib, hope he's soon to be approved sometime in September. Same for the topical agent to Rifumilast um, and uh, by Makizumab, which I'm going to talk about all of these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Tepinarov. I'll go through some of the slides. There were some references in Dr. Armstrong's talk, but you are going to see a promotional talk by Dr. Linda Steingold, and it's a really a fantastic deck. I've seen it, and it will really highlight a lot of the detail. But, um, you know, We've, we've been utilizing topical corticosteroids for the longest period of time, and they're great, but as um, I just showed in the slide, sorry to click on that too quickly, there are some consequences. Now, I think if we use them properly, the likelihood of us seeing these consequences is very small, but they do exist, and our patients who are either not inherit or overuse uh, therapies, particularly topical therapies, we can see these consequences of corticosteroids like tachyphylaxis, atrophy, telangiectasia, striate discoloration, and rarely HPA axis suppression. So Dr. Armstrong alluded to some of the effects of a TAMA, a T-A-M-A, a topical arahydrocarbon agonist modulating agent, and really very interesting. It does downregulate TH17 cytokines, decreasing inflammation in psoriasis. It also decreases interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and 13, and so it will likely have some effect in atopic dermatitis. And it's very unique in that it does promote the formation of philagrin, uh, loroquin, and involucrin uh, in the, the skin barrier in the stratum corneum. And so it's a very interesting product in that regard. And it's not an antagonist. It agonizes as a receptor, which also makes it unique. This is the soaring one and two trials, the phase three double bind vehicle control trials that led to the approval of Tepinarov uh, really just a couple of months ago. Um, here's the trial here, once daily application of this 1% topical agent, and there was a long-term extension period and very unique um, off-therapy part of the open-label extension. Again, uh, Dr. Steingold will go over a lot of that, but we really saw some robust responses in this modified imputation in the intent to treat population in the clinical trial, uh, where we saw about 35% in one trial and 40% in the other achieving clear or minimal disease with a two-grade improvement uh, from baseline. One unique thing to point out about this product is not only is the delta wide in the clinical trial, but this, the vehicle response is low. We, we typically see particularly high vehicle responses in a lot of these trials, uh, and we didn't see this in Soaring 1 or in Soaring 2. And, and, and Dr. Steingold will go over all of this too, but very unique to this product that at one point at least or another in the clinical trial, 40% uh, of patients achieved complete clearance and had a remission uh, during the clinical trial, and about 58% of subjects in the trial in the long-term extension that were at uh, a PGA2 or greater at one point in the trial uh, did have a period of remission. About 75% of the subjects in the trial had a, a period of remission of at least 57 days, 
115 days and 25% over 200 days. Um, treat to complete with this product, unlike corticosteroids, we can use the drug on a regular basis without the concerns of the typical side effects of corticosteroids. Now, the, the drug is not exempt of a potential local side effects uh, like contact dermatitis and folliculitis, and as in most clinical trials for psoriasis, we do see some upper respiratory tract infections. How that happens with a topical therapy, I'm not quite sure, but I think we'll all agree in clinical trial, patients do get colds and upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, this is Rufumilas. It's a topical PDE4 inhibitor. It is a cream, not an ointment. It's not your grandmother's PDE4 topical inhibitor, as we have had a product pre previously uh, for a different disease state. Um, once daily application, also looking at clear or minimal disease in terms of the IgA response, high benchmark in the clinical trial, with a two-grade improvement from, from baseline. The clinical trials were known as Dermis-1 and Dermis-2. Just to show some of the clinical trial responses, exciting in that we have new, highly effective agents coming to our toolbox. So if you look as early as week four, we see that delta, that separation of treatment success with clear or minimal disease just really in, in the first month. And if you look out to uh, both trials, very consistent responses between both trials. And again, another trial with a very low vehicle response. And so for me as a clinical trialist, I find that exciting. And we have in that 35 to 40 plus percent range of individual achieving clear uh, or minimal disease in this trial. Um, what we see here also is improvement to the itch response, which I'll just say in general for, uh, because of time, um, just we, we see the response in terms of a four grade improvement from baseline in the numeric rating score for itch, which as you know is a zero to 10 scale, zero being no itch, 10 being the worst, most unimaginable itch, and it's averaged over the course of the week and the subjects in the trial are asked what your itch was like in the past 24 hours, and we just see that each score just improve or continue to improve over, over time uh, with a very wide delta and statistically significant responses. One thing that's a really big challenge for treating our patients with psoriatic skin disease is treating the folds. You know, it's tough to use corticosteroids for a very long period of time. And so, as Dr. Friedman was talking before about just having non-steroidal agents, even though corticosteroids are still our mainstay for managing patients with our inflammatory skin disease, to have drugs that can be used in a continuum, that can be used without potential consequence, I think is another godsend. And so you see these robust responses in the clinical trials in terms of improvement in the intertrigen folds with Rufumilast. So the nice thing with having two non-steroidal agents, well, we have one now in the toolbox and hopefully two uh, very soon, is that we won't really have to struggle potentially with reminding our patients uh, about overuse of topical corticosteroids. I want to close with a few words about an oral systemic agent, a small molecule, non-biologic agent in Ducravacitinib. Now, all of us have seen a lot about this agent, and even as I'll talk about a couple of moments in Bimacuzumab, a biologic agent, uh, at the podium at many conferences. But, but I think it's exciting that we'll finally have another oral agent, hopefully soon in our toolbox. This is an oral selective tyrosine kinase 2 inhibitor, so a TIC2 inhibitor, unique mechanism of action, and it does work similarly uh, to the biologic uh, agent in eustachinumab and that it does appear to inhibit interleukin-12-23 uh, and also the type 1 interferon pathway. And, and we'll look at some of the, the basic uh, responses in the clinical trials. What we know in terms of the benchmark for the clinical trial, in terms of POSI 75 responses, is there were significantly more subjects in the trial versus uh, placebo that achieved POSI 75, and that was statistically significant, and also a co-primary endpoint of clear minimal disease. It was also more effective than a premolast in terms of achieving POSI 75 by about one and a half times. And this is just some of the data here. There's been many publications. This is just one um, from Dr. Armstrong as published in ARD. You see the statistically significant differences, not only be between treatment group with the six milligram once daily uh, oral therapy of uh, Ducravacitinib versus placebo with a very nice wide delta, a little bit of a placebo response, and again, about one and a half times as many individuals in the Ducravacitinib treatment group achieve POSI 75 and also clear minimal disease compared to a premolast. 
Uh, in terms of safety in both, th both three clinical, phase three clinical trials, the drug was very well tolerated. And the main adverse events were that of nasopharyngitis and URI. There were some low rates of headache, diarrhea, and nausea. Uh, but the rates were lower than that would we typically see with a premolas. And the discontinuation rates were also lower in decravacitinib as compared uh, to both placebo and premolas. Let me finish up by talking about bimekizumab, uh, a biologic therapy which hopefully will make it to market. Um, it's an investigational human monoclonal uh, uh, antibody, a IgG1 monoclonal antibody that selectively inhibits interleukin 17A and F, and if approved, it'll be the fourth biologic, and there might even be a fifth in the class of interleukin 17 blockers. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. It was studied in a multitude of clinical trials, be ready, be sure, be vivid, and also be radiant, and I'll, I'll focus on a couple of them, just a couple of moments. Be sure was a 56-week trial and a 52-week trial, be, uh, be vivid trial with bimekizumab treated subjects um, demonstrating superior skin clearance uh, in a 16-week controlled uh, period in the clinical trial versus a multitude of head-to-head -head comparator agents in adalidumab, bustiginumab, and also versus placebo. And these were statistically significant differences with a high bar of POSI-90. The B-Radiant trial was unique in that it was the first phase three study to compare the efficacy and safety of a dual interleukin 17A and F uh, inhibitor versus an interleukin 17A inhibitor. The study met uh, all its primary endpoints with significantly more patients uh, achieving very high bar of POSI 100 at week 16, um, where there are significant numbers, 61% achieving that high bar. I mean, we talked before about how far we come, so over 60% of the, pa the patient subjects in the trial achieving this very high bar, with also a very robust response in, in the secuginumab group. This is the really first time that we've seen a head-to-head -head comparison within the 17 class. Of course, we have seen that um, within other classes of agents, such as TNF inhibitors. I want to close also by talking about the use of bimekizumab in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, this is uh, clinical trial data from the Annals of Rheumatic Diseases, just published a few years back. And what I wanted to show is the robust ACR responses, where we typically like to measure up biologic therapies in a 60 40 20 guideline. 60% of individuals in the trials, trials achieving ACR 20, um, the, about 40% achieving ACR 50, and somewhere in the 20 to 30% of individuals achieving ACR 70. And so in the clinical trial here, we see close to 80% of patients achieving ACR20. And I, I just think that we've got a really uh, effective therapy in the toolbox here, and hopefully it will come to market, particularly our, for our patients who have background uh, psoriatic joint disease. The safety looks pretty good, although there appear to be particularly high rates of oral candidiasis in the neighborhood of about 20%. So we'll have to see what happens post-marketing with bimekizumab. Uh, over 48 weeks in the clinical trials, uh, the incidence of serious treatment adverse, uh, emergent adverse events was about 5.9% um, with bimekizumab and 5.7% with secukinumab, and, and that was in the um, B-radiant trial. I want to close with um, uh, just another agent that uh, is being studied, the interleukin 17A blocker, which is Munakizumab for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. Um, I'm query as to the need for another 17A blocker, but I wanted to be able to close with something that's pretty new. Um, so that is a, another interleukin 17A blocker where it looks like there are some pretty robust POSI 75 and POSI 90 responses, some are similar to what we see with the agents that we have in the toolbox. I will point out here that there is a little bit of follow for over, over time. We, we tend to do see that with interleukin 17 blockers. And as Dr. Armstrong talked about dose ex escalation being necessary with some agents, we may perhaps uh, need to dose escalate this drug uh, looking at the very preliminary clinical trial data. So with that, I will stop um, and uh, move on to our next talk. Those are my wonderful residents who I have an opportunity to work with on a weekly basis. And uh, Joe, to you again, thank you so much for having me and thank you for your attention.